Hi, I'm Ashley Hawkins, and I am the Manga Librarian. And today, we are talking about shoujo manga. And let's go ahead and dive right in. So, shoujo manga is going to be a, a lot. Um, I'm probably not going to cover everything in one video. Um, today I am going to talk to you a little bit about the history of shoujo manga, um, the characteristics that make shoujo manga different from shonen manga, and um, that's probably going to encompass this video. And that's our focus for today. So, um, Shoujo manga is quite simply manga that is published in shoujo magazines and tankaban in Japan. Um, it is any manga that is aimed at the demographic of girls, um, primarily between the ages of 12 and 18, um, although it, it is and can be read by older audiences. Um, it commonly is read by older audiences. Um, and that's really it. Uh, it can encompass many, many genres. Um, it's important to remember that shoujo and shonen are not genres. Um, this can be confusing, I think, for um, people in the United States for a variety of reasons. Um, they seem to think that uh, shonen and shoujo are genres, but they're not. Um, now, that's not to say that they don't have characteristics and that those characteristics aren't different. Um, the same way, you know, young adult literature has characteristics that are different from uh, romance novels. You know, your demographics dictate certain aspects. So, um, let's start off by diving a little bit into the history of shoujo. Um, actually, before that, let me talk a little bit about why am I talking so in depth about shoujo before I have like a, an in depth of talk about shonen. And the fact is, is that you probably know a lot about shonen. Um, most people do know a lot about shonen um, and its characteristics. They know a lot of titles. They know a lot of what's going on. Um, and it's just generally what gets marketed more readily. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, and a lot of them probably have to do with, you know, the fact that shonen is marketed toward a male audience and shoujo is marketed toward a feminine audience and also encompasses quite a bit of queer stories and perspectives. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where shoujo comes from. And actually, in talking about the history of shoujo, we are going to talk a little bit about the history of shonen because they go hand in hand. So part of the reason why we have this breakdown um, of categories by, by, um, by gender has to do with how magazines were formed in the early 1900s. Um, so there were magazines that were made and published for children in Japan around 1902, 1906. Um, and that really created a culture uh, that permeated and still permeates where there is media, there, there's this focus on creating media for boys, creating media for girls. Um, 
and this is all in what we call the Meiji area, the Meiji era. Um, 1902 Shoujo Kai, uh, which translates to Girls World, is in is the first published, and this is really the segregation um, of children's magazines, and also. You should know that the education system was also segregated at the time. Boys and girls went to different schools. Um, and in the pre-war era, manga took up just a few pages. Um, there were just some little comic strips in every, uh, every magazine, but there were other things. Um, serialized novels with illustrations um and these novels and their illustrations would eventually set the stage for the proliferation of uh, children's manga but there was a lot of censorship and paper rationing um during world war ii that basically through 1937 all the way up to like 1950 um children's magazines were really negatively impacted so we had kind of this in japan there was kind of this blank well not really blank space but there's just this dearth like that there, there really wasn't much being published much being generated because of the war um because you had the um, Japanese uh, Second Sino War that flowed into the Second World War. And at that point, you know, things were very, you know, very negatively impacted in terms of paper media. Um, and then the 50s came around and the there were publishers in Osaka that realized they could use um, cheap recycled pulp paper and um, they made uh, these books that were called Akohan um, which are uh, called red books um, because they use a uh, red ink and black ink and they they were very cheap and they were very, you know, they were very cheap to produce, very cheap to purchase, and it was kind of standard fare until, and I also want to point out, like, everybody talks about Osama Tezuka, Osamu Tezuka um, as, like, the founder of, like, all manga, but there was manga before Osamu Tezuka. Um, but he definitely was the one who figured out that this could be bigger than what it was. So what he did was he took kind of the Japanese style and incorporated, um, the popular Disney and European styles of the time and made his own very epic stories of serialized fiction and um he called it story manga and that made this big explosion and he eventually created this story called Ribbon no Kishi um which is also called Princess Knight um and there were a lot of these female protagonists who were heroines. Um, they were like, you know, 13. They were all like separated from their moms. They had this very Disney story. You know, they had no mothers. Um, they were treated terribly by stepmothers um, until some dude shows up and he's kind of hot and he rescues them. Um, and the romance is like very non-existent and so it's like 
you know, it wasn't quite there yet. And then we see finally um, in the mid 1960s, uh, Nishitani Yoshiko, uh, who finally taps into, because what happened was for a while, manga was really just for children. And then as time moved on, young Japanese people were reading manga more and more into their teens. And finally, Nishitani Yoshiko figured out like, hey, maybe romance, dealing with friendship, dealing with family, school, falling in love, these type of storylines. And that's really where we see um, older girls get very invested in shoujo manga. Um, and by the end of the 60s, all of a sudden manga's in a huge mega boom. Um, and the popularity of manga leads to, uh, and also paired with um, the rise of television, leads to this rise in, uh, okay, we can't just publish these on a monthly format because before it was just a monthly format. Now they're getting published on a weekly format. Um, and this actually enabled women to really break into the manga scene because quite honestly, they needed the influx of talent. So what happened was because, you know, societal attitudes towards women were changing, because there was this high demand for more and more manga artists, a lot of women became manga artists. Um, and so there was just this perfect environment. Um, and there was a high demand for these stories. Um, and that's where we see like the rise of Motohagio, Yomiko, Oshima, uh, Keiko Takamiya, um, and they're really experimenting with these themes of like gender and sexuality and much more mature themes than had been dealt with previously. Um, and so by the 70s, we see it burst into um, a bunch of these genres and subgenres. So we've got fantasy shoujo titles, we've got sci-fi shoujo titles, we see boys love, we see um, the emergence of all these things so that it's not just, you know, schoolgirl romances. We see so many wildly different things. And then that really paved the road for Jose, um, where there were more and more stories directed towards adult women. Um, and a lot of this bridging. And what this enabled was shoujo can really enable because shoujo is really built on shonen is all about action and fighting and you know personal development and developing strength in a lot of ways but shoujo is really about the interpersonal and it's really about the internal it's about emotion it's about feeling um and that is really shoujo strength. Shoujo strength is that um, the stories can really focus on the characters and their emotions and what they feel. Um, and it's through this kind of weird history of like, it started off as just 
sort of this very monolithic thing and then kind of burst and exploded um, because a bunch of societal um, confluences happened. So that's the basic story um, or the basic history of shoujo manga. If you want to know more, um, first off, uh, my primary source for all of this is um, the writings of Rachel Thorne. Um, and I will provide a link to her Twitter account and you can find her blog through there. Um, I, I want to give you her Twitter account because uh, her blog has her dead name on it and I, I want to um, I want to direct you to her first and then you can find her work through her Twitter and um, how she chooses to share her work. Um, but she is by far the preeminent scholar on shoujo manga. She actually teaches on manga and comics in Japan um, and her work is absolutely vital to somebody like me whose Japanese is not the best. <laughs> um, like I'm okay, I can survive, but um, she's been doing this work for so many years and has written so much and has so much experience. She does translations. She is absolutely an expert. Um, if you really want to get deep into shoujo manga, you really need to read Rachel Thorne's writings. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think in, in English, there's just nobody else who is a better source. Um, I also utilized this book, um, Manga Manga, The World of Japanese Comics. It is a book from 1983, but it is still an excellent um, resource. Um, and so I highly recommend it. Um, it'll only take you up to 1983, but it will give you a really good foundational history. Um, also, if you want to know more about shoujo manga, particularly in a modern context and want to know about specific titles, then the podcast uh, Shoujo and Tell is another resource that I highly, highly recommend, especially from a collection development um, point of view. Uh, if you don't have time to read a 25 volume series, um, Ashley, who runs Shoujo and Tell, um, does a really great job of talking through the series, talking through issues with the various series and having discussions with her guests that are really enlightening. And, um, more than likely though, every episode you're going to leave just wanting to read whatever it is she talks about. And it's really nice to have something that focuses on shoujo titles as opposed to you know, the stuff that always gets talked about. And um, it's, yeah, um, I highly recommend it. Like I said, from, from a collection development point of view, it's very, very useful. If you're trying to find more shoujo, um, at the very least, looking through what Ashley has covered on the show is going to give you a good idea of what titles you probably should add to your collection because she does cover the essential titles and um, it runs the full gamut of um, their it's newer titles as well as older titles, classic titles. There's there's a wide gamut of things that are covered on show, show and tell. So uh, what are some characteristics of shoujo manga? Um, like why, why talk about it um, as sort of a monolithic thing if it's just a demographic category? Um, so first off, we have to kind of talk about the art style because there is a difference in how shoujo is drawn, um, how, 
the art style of shoujo is different from the way shonen is done. There are reasons why um, a manga will wind up in a shonen magazine or a shoujo magazine. And um, there are characteristics. So a shoujo magazine is, you know, like I said, targeted towards, um, you know, feminine people, um, primarily 12 to 18, although it will be read sometimes by older audiences, um, <clears throat> especially depending on who the artist or the mangaka is. Um, and so there are certain visual appeals um, that are there. So first off, the thing that's interesting with shoujo is that it actually tends to be more abstract than shonen. Um, shonen tends to really follow rules of, um, of paneling. Um, panels don't tend to get broken as much, although they, they do. Like, there, it's not to say there isn't experimentation in shonen and that nobody ever does anything unique. Um, but it's not as standard as it is for shoujo. Um, shoujo really plays with um, form and format. Um, there's a lot of, and I'll, I'll even show you a little bit of it. Um, classic examples. Um, so here's a panel that's featured in Manga Manga. Um, as you can see, it's very abstract. There aren't even any panels on this page. Um, And often there's a lot of flourishes that are put on to pages. So here are a couple of different pages that are featured in here. And they have, you know, flowers and different embellishments. Um, clothing tends to be very lush, um, very expertly drawn. Um, fashion can be kind of a a point of interest. Um, famously, uh, the mangaka behind Sailor Moon, <coughs> excuse me, the mangaka behind Sailor Moon is a huge fan of fashion and actually utilizes it very frequently. Um, and that can actually be something that shows up pretty frequently in shoujo. It doesn't show up in everything. Not everybody's super into drawing clothes. Um, but you'll see more variation in what characters wear in shoujo than you will in shonen. In shonen, there tends to be like a uniform, um, which also I think plays into how easy it is to adapt shonen to anime because everybody has, even if they're not wearing a school uniform they have a uniform there's like a set outfit they always wear and in shoujo their outfits probably change quite a bit um they they wear different things um and there's even like plot points sometimes about like oh your outfit today is really cute and oh that outfit really suits you or there might be or oh, I feel so awkward wearing something fancy like this. Um, there's actually a plot point in um, Hanayori Dango where uh, the main character is kind of kidnapped and um, they dress her up in a really fancy outfit and then tell her like, oh, well, all of this costs, da 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 da. Um, but the important thing is, is like clothes actually play a slightly higher point of interest in shoujo than they might in shonen. Um, and part of that probably has to do with the target audience. Um, 
hairstyles might shift way more. Um, hair tends to be much more flowy. Um, there, there tends to be a certain style for hair. Um, eyes tend to be bigger in shoujo. Um, a little bit bigger, a little bit sparklier. Um, so those are like artistic things that make shoujo um shoujo story wise um like i said you're going to see a lot more internal stuff going on um it's going to there might be action and adventure there's going there are sci-fi there are fantasy there are all these all these genres exist in shoujo um i mean a lot of clamp is shoujo um a lot of like there are a lot of stories that have shoujo and shonen elements um but the things that tend to push them more into shoujo will be the more emotional stuff so there might be a love triangle there might be um a bit more of a focus on just the interpersonal relationships um it's really about the character. The protagonist is typically winning over the other characters through her personality and through her relating to other people, as opposed to um, in Shonen, where a lot of the ways that characters bond is typically through strength, physical strength. Um, it, in shoujo, it's more about emotional strength and emotional maturity. Um, so that tends to be more of what you see in shoujo. Um, and then like I said, you'll see you'll, you'll see far more relationship drama. You will also see far more friendship drama. Um, relationship drama is like a big part of it. And oftentimes the friendship drama or the drama between peers um, is in part because of attention that the the protagonist is getting from um, the love interest. But um, there's often like peer group struggles and these are all things that you know teenage girls can really relate to and so it it tends to come through something else to point out though is that it's not just heterosexual romance that gets depicted in shoujo shoujo is the nesting category for yuri um most yuri and boys love um so a lot of queer stories um that are told in a a loving um dramatic way are shoujo or jose um it's not to say there isn't ecchi versions or hentai versions of yuri tales. Um, sexualization of women exists in Japan, undoubtedly, but there's also like a big movement of uh, women loving women stories written by women. And boys love has for, and yaoi has for a long period of time been kind of a, uh, an area that is predominantly female driven. So you see shoujo kind of housing not just uh, heterosexual romance, but also queer romance. And so shonen tends to be far more straight than shoujo does shoujo tends to be a bit more fluid um there tends to be more expression of gender identity more um gender gets played with a lot more in shoujo than it does in shonen 
Um, oftentimes, if gender does get played with in shonen, it's often for laughs or it's in a disrespectful tone. There are exceptions because there are exceptions to everything when we're talking about this, especially in recent years, because we are seeing shifts in attitude, but primarily shoujo is going to be the home of better attitudes. Now that doesn't mean that shoujo is free from a lot of criticisms. Um, just as it can be home to like all sorts of positives, it can also be home to a lot of stereotypes, um, a lot of negative depictions of women um, because of internalized misogyny or um, just sometimes some stories, you read them and you go, whoa, man. Um, there's, you know, in the 90s, there were definitely some very questionable, questionable things about consent um, that got published. So there can be, that type of stuff can be present. A lot of the same issues that kind of correlate to issues that happened with young adult novels, you can see them correlate with um, shoujo. Um, you know, the, the treatment of queer relationships and queer characters um, is not always perfect. Um, sometimes there's fetishization, um, but there's definitely there's slightly more hope in shoujo sometimes. Um, like I said, that doesn't mean shonen has no hope and that there's nothing there um, in terms of like freedom of gender expression. We're getting slowly better. Um, and there's definitely an internal pressure from people in Japan to start pushing stories to be more inclusive and we're seeing that in things that are being published and now things that are being localized so um and don't let anybody tell you that it's because of pressure from people in the united states all these liberals are forcing anime to be more blah 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 it, it's people in japan that are demanding these stories like it's we don't have that much power um so I don't know. Um, it's getting better. It's not perfect. Um, there's definitely a lot to to work on. Um, but yeah, you'll see you'll see questionable things about consent. Um, there's a lot of stuff about questionable age gaps, um, especially in shoujo. Um, and that can be really, especially for an educator, you get you get to this certain point where you're like, oh my god, what are these what are these teachers doing with these girls or these boys, dear lord? Um, and it's not cool, but it does exist. Be aware of it. It can exist in even some of the best series. The reason why I can't ever say, oh, hey, grab card captor Sakura for uh, your elementary school is because there is a relationship between a fifth grader and a teacher. So um, you can't make this up. You can't. Um, it just, it's there. I love Cardcaptor Sakura. Um, my brain chooses to like eject the fact that there is a rom romantic connection between those two characters on a regular basis, but the fact remains that it's there and that means that that book should never be on an elementary school shelf. Um, <clears throat> just is what it is. Because um, it's just n not appropriate. Um, Clamp has some weird stuff with ages. Uh, and there's just no way to get around it. Um, 
There, there's other things you can get. Other magical girl stories. Um, so that should kind of encapsulate quite a bit. I don't want to go too much deeper because there's more. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this here and next time I do one of these long form videos, I'm going to talk to you about magical girls. Um, so it's kind of a continuation of shoujo, but we're going to go a little deeper and talk about the magical girl genre and what it's, what's going on there. And that's where we'll go. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, let me know, um, if there are any, if, if you have any questions, please reach out and I will see you in the next video.